much of northwestern Mexico looks like this. It's mostly desert country, very much like our southwestern United States. But here, irrigated farming is bringing new crops and prosperity on both sides of the border. About in the center of the Mexican part of this desert is a little town called Casas Grandes, which means big houses. And in one of the big houses lives a farmer named Alvarado. Of course, an early morning chore for both the senor and his wife is to feed some corn to the chickens in their large rear courtyard, which is surrounded by an adobe wall and has storage sheds and a granary, as well as space for the chickens. After they have been fed, we take a look at the main patio of this farmer's home. In spring and summer, it's bright with many colored flowers and shrubs. But now everything is brown and bare because winter is coming on. All the rooms in the house open onto this patio. And out of her sewing room, Senora Alvarado comes to ask her husband to take her to the store for some new dress material. While they're getting ready to go to town, let's see what the outside of the house looks like. The irrigation canal flowing here is a good place for the farmer's ducks to stretch and enjoy themselves. It also waters the trees that provide relief from the hot summer sun. Glass in the windows and screens all around make this home look pretty much like homes in the southwestern United States, don't they? The reason the Alvarados use an old car is not because they can't afford a newer one. It's because older cars can get over the bumpy dirt roads around Casas Grandes better than new ones. While Senor and Senora Alvarado are in town, their son rides his favorite horse out to the fields to work. His name is Carlos, that's Charles in English. And even though their large fields are cultivated with a tractor, the part that will grow the family vegetables gets a finer going over with a hole. But here comes Carlos' uncle, who is a mechanic. He has come because the hay baler broke down not long ago and naturally must be repaired before a new crop is ready to harvest. After a few minutes of talk, they set out to inspect the machine. Notice the hay mow near the front of the picture. No more back-breaking cutting by hand for this farmer. Just beyond the red hay baler is a harvester combine, one of many that are simplifying farm work in Mexico. Machines are the tools of all modern farmers. But what are the two main materials with which every farmer works? The first of these is the earth itself. Some Mexican soil is pretty much like clay. It takes a lot of work and fertilizer to make a crop grow here. But much of this part of the country is only a thin layer of dirt mixed with stones that lies directly on solid rock. Since it is not very deep, it dries out quickly, which brings us to the second basic material that every farmer uses. No crop will grow without water, and northwestern Mexico doesn't get much rain. So for many, many years, the farmers have built little canals to bring the water of mountain springs down to their fields in the valleys. Nowadays, large dams are being built to store up the rainfall and make the desert productive, just as we are doing in Arizona and California. The earth, plus water and hard work by the farmers, results in good crops, such as this one. Do you recognize what is growing in this field? Just in case you're having trouble, here's a close-up of one of the plants to help out. Yes, cotton is now one of the most important farm products south of the border. After it's picked, the ripe cotton is loaded into trucks and brought to the cotton gin. The modern factory that we'll see here has all been developed from the hand-operated cotton gin invented by Eli Whitney. Today, cotton is sucked up by what we might call an enormous vacuum cleaner and blown into storage bins. Later, it is pushed into suction tubes again and carried to the ginning machines, which tear the cotton fibers away from the seed and clean them. These levers the man pulls feed in more raw cotton. From the ginning machines, the fibers are blown over to the compressor that packs about 500 pounds of fluffy fiber into a mold somewhat smaller than a full-sized cotton bale. And while one mold is being packed, workmen are busy getting an empty mold ready for the machine. By poking his fingers through slits in the side, this man can tell when just enough fiber has been packed. 
and then the empty mold is swung around to take the place of the one that is full. The fiber in the mold is kept under pressure while being tied with thin metal straps. And here begins almost the only operation that still has to be done by hand in a modern mechanized cotton gin. With the hook end of the long straps bent down, the rest is pushed across the top to the other side, where another man bends them again and pushes them back underneath the bale toward us. With the sides of the mold open, the free ends are finally bent and fastened into the hooks. But notice that the straps are still pretty loose around the cotton. In a moment, however, after the corners of the burlap cover have been tucked in place, the pressure will be removed from the mold. And now, if you look closely, you can see the cotton expanding so that the straps are very tight around the bale. Then, with a big push, the finished bale is rolled out of the way, for the compressing machine never stops working. Meanwhile, the completed bale has been put on a little trailer and is pulled out to the storage yard, where it will join many others leaning against one another in long rows. Here, a big truck is being loaded with cotton to go to some Mexican factory where it will be woven into cloth. Or perhaps it will be shipped abroad. For Mexico's industrious farmers grow more cotton than their own country needs. So much of it is exported. Now in our imagination, let's leap high over the mountains that are called Sierra Madre Occidental and go almost due south to a little town near the Gulf of California. The name of this village is Pericos, and it too is right in the middle of the desert. Cactus plants grow 40 feet tall among a thick mass of thorny trees and bushes. You might think that the easiest way to clear this land for farming would be with a bulldozer, but the sandy soil grinds into machinery and wears it out, so it's cheaper to chop everything down by hand. The largest trees are left for shade, and the giant cacti are killed by cutting their roots. When they're dead, they can be removed without any danger of the farmer getting all stuck up about his new field. One of the most profitable crops grown here is henequen. Those narrow green leaves don't look much like rope, do they? But just wait. The young henequen plants are carefully cultivated and watered in a nursery for three years. Then they are transplanted to fields where they are set farther apart and allowed to grow for four more years until they get about this big. By the time they are seven years old, their oldest leaves are large enough and long enough to begin harvesting. Once a year, a few of the bottom leaves are cut from each plant, bundled into trucks and taken to the nearby factory, where, as you can see, the men have to be pretty careful unloading the bundles because of the many sharp thorns along both edges of each leaf. Here again, we point out the large amounts of machinery being used in even the rural sections of modern Mexico. For now, the henequen leaves are pushed into an enormous tub where they are very quickly cooked by steam. The reason for doing this is because there are many long, tough fibers, like strings, running almost the entire length of each leaf. Cooking makes it easy for a machine to strip out these fibers, clean and free of any soft pulp. They go to a man, who checks to be sure they are really clean, and then sends them downstairs to another worker who loads them on a wheelbarrow. But that isn't all of the fiber in the leaves, for in the bottom of the tub is another machine that mashes the pulp and strains quite a few short fibers out of it, so that actually there isn't much waste to a henequen leaf. The short fibers are loaded on a wheelbarrow too and taken to the drying yard, where they can safely be spread out on the ground to dry because their shortness keeps them from packing down close to the earth where the dew would make them rot. But even several days of lying in the hot desert sun is not enough to thoroughly dry out these fibers. So they must be tossed in the air and separated and turned over to be sure the sun and air will reach every one. The long fibers must dry over wires to allow the air to circulate all around them and preserve their toughness, which is important. By the time they reach this stage of processing, the henequen fibers are called by a new name, and that name is hemp. When completely dried, the hemp is gathered into large bales and stored away for future manufacture into useful products. What products? Well, a rough cloth for sacks is one, and twine is another. 
but perhaps the most important use of hemp is in rope. And of course, rope has many uses, including, yes, even including this one. <laughs>